So our next guest and speaker, Mary Caldor, is Professor of Global Governance at the London School of Economics. She's also Director of the Civil Society of, and Human Security Research Unit there. She also teaches at the Institut Barcelona de Estudis Internationales. She's a key figure in the development of cosmopolitan democracy. Today, Mary will explore, is war an anachronism? Please welcome Mary Caldor. very much for inviting me here. It's really amazing to be here. And I hope I'm not going to be a terrible dampener because I'm going to talk about another existential risk, the existential, another man-made existential risk, the existential risk of war. You know, we're living in a terrible moment with wars in Ukraine, the war in Gaza, uh, with wars, endless wars, in Somalia, Congo, Sudan. Um, and so you might think that the question I gave myself, is war an anachronism, is a rather odd question. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is to try to explain to you why it's not odd, or what in fact I mean by it. You know, last night, the Israelis carried out a heavy bombardment in northern Gaza and also engaged in fighting. And this was the area they were supposed to have conquered. And yet Hamas is still there. It's still sending rockets against Israel. It's still ambushing soldiers from tunnels. It's still running the territory. And this illustrates the main point that I want to make which is war is an anachronism in the sense that it's no longer effective as an instrument of policy. It's extremely difficult to defeat enemies. It's extremely difficult to capture and control territory. It's really difficult to do what the American strategist Thomas Schelling called compellence, to make your enemy do what you want them to do. Despite killing nearly 35,000 people and reducing northern Gaza to, rebel, uh, to rubble, they still haven't managed to defeat Hamas. And this is a lesson that Russia ought to be learning in Ukraine. It's a lesson the West should have learned in Korea, in Vietnam, in Afghanistan, and in Iraq. Uh, this lesson um, is really why I mean that war is an anachronism. So why is this the case? And I think the, we've seen all these examples of wonderful technology, but technology can also do terrible things. And it has to do with the development of advanced military technology on all sides. Military technology has become more and more destructive, more and more accurate. And so in wars between symmetrical opponents, regular forces, well armed, you either get endless stalemate, as you got between Iran and Iraq in the 1980s, or you're beginning to see now in Ukraine and Russia, or if it escalates, there's the risk of nuclear annihilation, of human extinction from war. And then there are the asymmetrical wars. Non-state actors like the Houthis, like Hamas, like in Afghanistan, are able to develop what I call vernacular technology, which is extremely effective. It might be improvised explosive devices that are made from fertilizers and detergents and triggered with mobile phones. Or it might be commercial drones equipped 
with explosives. And, you know, many, many years ago, in the middle of the 19th century, this was predicted by Frederick Engels, who said, the time will come when the smallest possible torpedo will be able to hit the greatest battleship. So when I say that war is no longer effective, I don't mean that it's no longer destructive, nor do I mean that military force has no utility. On the contrary, there are large parts of the world where a combination of state and non-state actors are able to use military force against civilians in very destructive ways for a range of political and economic purposes. It may be to create fear so that you can mobilize around extremist ideologies like ethnic sectarianism or religious fundamentalism. Or it may be simply a way of making money by setting up a checkpoint, by kidnapping or hostage taking, by looting, by smuggling, which happens a lot in wars, by taxing humanitarian assistance. There are all kinds of ways in which violent methods can be used to make money. And I think there are large parts of the world where this sort of combination of multiple warring parties engaged in these kinds of activities have created long-term intractable violence. Large parts of Africa, large parts of the Middle East, some parts of Southeast Asia. It's not really war, it's a kind of mixture of political violence and crime. And it involves large-scale population displacement, as well as, of course, the casualties of war. And these kinds of long-scale intractable violence are incredibly difficult to end and have a tendency to spread. So my fear is that this might be the end result of what's happening in Gaza, what's happening in Ukraine, and it will bring that kind of social condition, I would call it, rather than war, closer to Europe and America. Now, a very important element of all this is international law. What makes a soldier different from a criminal? What makes him a hero and not a murderer. It is that war is supposed to be a legitimate activity. It's supposed to respect international law. It's judged by a whole series of arguments about right authority, just cause, mainly self-defense, or just means, not killing civilians. And these laws although they were codified in the late 19th century, have a long tradition. Krishna talked about them before the great battle of the Mahabharat. Um, the first caliph, Abu Bakr, said we shouldn't even cut down trees or kill sheep in wars. Uh, and it's in the Jewish and Christian traditions as well, but they were codified in the late 19th century. But it's nowadays almost impossible to conduct this kind of war without breaking international law. International law just no longer works. Uh, you have non-state actors, that's to do with right authority. The Americans extended self-defense to be anticipatory self-defense. Uh, then they said, it was all right to kill terrorists, non-state actors, to have long-distance assassination because they were somehow called illegal combatants. And now we're seeing Israel claim that bombing homes and hospitals are all right because there are illegal combatants, Hamas, in those homes and in those hospitals. This is a real travesty of international law. So, in other words, I mean, I don't mean that all uses of force are necessarily illegitimate. We might need to use force 
to protect people from genocide, from human rights violations, from the kind of violence we're seeing. But it has to operate in a, within very different rules of engagement, something more like policing than war fighting. Uh, and that means that we have to rethink a lot of international law. Now, before I conclude, I wanted to say something about the links with other existential threats. Because here we're mainly talking about climate change, but we also talked about capitalism, and there's no question that extreme inequality is what contributes to war. Um, actually, the relationship between, with other existential risks is deeply interconnected, but very complex. But let me mention uh, a couple of factors. One is that the various warring parties are often competing for revenues, for money that comes from control of minerals. You know, they're competing for, particularly oil and gas, they're competing for access to the states, which are very dependent on oil and gas. They're competing for local government. They're trying to get access to those revenues in maybe unusual way by, say, kidnapping oil workers and getting their companies to pay more, or blowing up pipelines and getting the companies or governments to pay them to protect those pipelines. There are all kinds of ways in which the, the excessive revenues that very often come from miner minerals and are in such demand uh, can create an incentive for violence. So I think one argument that's very important to be made when we're talking about climate change is that ending our dependence on oil and gas is not just about climate change. It's also about ending the sources of revenue that preserve authoritarianism and that contribute to the kind of violence I'm talking about. The other element, which in a way relates to all existential threats, is that this type of violence makes it incredibly difficult to build the capacity to address climate disasters. Um, it hugely weakens, the hugely strengthens the vulnerability of different groups to be able to withstand the sort of disasters they're facing, to be able to cope with disease, to be able to cope with extreme poverty. And in a way, what I think is um, the whole elements of what we're living through, what some people call the polycrisis, each one reinforces the other. In a way, what I'm saying is, it's going to be, to, to quote Catherine, it's going to be very difficult to fix the climate crisis without also fixing war. So let me finally conclude. When I say that war is an anachronism, what I mean is that it's no longer possible to use war as an instrument of policy. It's no longer possible if it ever was to conduct a war within the framework of international law. Instead, what we're seeing is growing parts of the world characterized by long-term, intractable, illegitimate violence, this mixture that I talked about of crime and war. So is there an alternative? Any alternative would need to be based on rethinking international law. It would be need to rethink international law in terms of human rights, individual rights, rather than war. And it would involve a strengthening of international and global institutions that uphold international law. Um, and it would also require efforts 
which are very difficult to reverse this social condition of long-term intractable violence. Um, so, are there any reasons to think that we might move in that direction? Can we talk about crumbs of hope, the hope that both Jane and Catherine referred to? Well, let me just try to finish by mentioning a few of those crumbs of hope. First, I do think there's a much greater public emphasis nowadays on international law. That's actually what we've seen in the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. Uh, we've seen a much greater role for the International Criminal Court. Uh, we've seen civil society groups in all these areas collecting evidence, documenting evidence of war crimes. Um, we saw that the ICC indicted President Putin for deporting children from Ukraine. Um, we also have seen in Gaza the role of the uh, Court of Justice in bringing South Africa brought this genocide case. And we're also seeing an extension of what's known as universal ju jurisdiction, where Syrian warlords, for example, are being tried in German courts. So I think this growing emphasis on international law is one crumb of hope. But the second crumb of hope comes from civil society, both at global and at local levels. Uh, I think at global levels, we're seeing an extraordinary public outrage, both at what Hamas did on October the 7th and at the slaughter that is happening in Gaza. But actually, we see a lot of civil society activities at local levels. Within these areas of violence, what holds people together, what provides the first responders in uh, violent episodes, who they, who provide the health and education and the things that exist, if they do in these areas, are often civil society groups or civic-minded people. And at local levels, there are often many agreements. Some of them are horrible agreements between armed forces, but some of them are positive agreements involving civilians and involving civil society. And they do offer a crumb of hope for the future. So I would say, if only the global and the local could get together, what we might see were some openings for changing the kind of international and local arrangements that govern respect for law uh, and everyday peace, which is what we want. Uh, those openings are also necessary to tackle all the other existential risks we face. So let's cling on to that little possibility of hope. Thank you.